what a time to be alive. Uh, things that we usually only know from science fiction stories or even from the Bible may be possible now or in the next years because of a whole series of scientific breakthroughs. Blind people might be able to see again. Diseases that were deadly up to now could be cured. And maybe 80 years from now, we will all still be able to meet. Well, if we get, we'll be able to meet in physically. Well, anyway, at 109 the conference uh, because we have stayed young and fit for so long. <laughs> Where do we stand with gene therapies and drugs for age-related diseases? And what potential does new medical technology like brain-computer interfaces offer? We want to talk to, uh, about this with three wonderful speakers who, because of the pandemic, join us remotely. Please welcome on the left, Carolina Aguila. She's the CEO of InBrain Neuroelectronics, a startup working on brain-computer interfaces Carolina or Carola collected 15 years of experience in the medtech industry before founding her startup and she has a great motto. It's the best way to predict the future is to create it. Great to have you with us, Carolina. Thank you. Excellent. Great, she can hear us. That's good. And on the right side, we have uh, Michael Greve. Michael is one of the most successful founders of the German-speaking internet industry. Together with his brother, he started Web.de. And after the successful sale of this company, he created uh, the venture capital investor Kizu. And now he's on a new mission with his Forever Healthy Foundation. His goal is to enable people to extend their healthy lifespan. Hi, Michael. Hello, schön, to be here. Great. And then the third panelist is Vitaly Ponomarev. Vitaly is an international technology entrepreneur, investor, mobility enthusiast and longevity evangelist with ties to Switzerland, Russia and the EU. He's known for funding, founding and leading a deep tech company, Veyray, and he's also the founder, founder and the visionary behind Centaura, a research organization working to fight aging. Hi, Vitaly. Hi, hi. Thank you for, Great. for, um, for the invitation. Thank you. Thanks. Um, before we, we start, um, on this panel, we'll definitely have the chance to answer some of your questions. So use the Q&A chat over there. And we try to answer as many questions as possible. But first, I ask the questions. I go first. And as a first question to each of you, three, which diseases or disabilities, what do you think, will no longer exist in 10, 15, or maybe 20 years? Carolina, maybe you start. Hopefully, brain-related diseases. Can you get, get some examples? Give us some ex examples of brain-related diseases that you mean? Well, you know, we are concentrated in a few of them, but of course, Parkinson's, epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease, which is very tragic for many families, um, depression, uh, you name it, right? Uh, that there's a big variety of diseases that could be cured in the next years. But of course, we have to also be conservative because there's good research that need to be put in order to achieve that, right? And good technology. Michel, what do you think? Uh, which diseases or disabilities will no longer exist in a decade or two decades? Well, I hope we are, uh, as you said, we are in, involved in several startups. so. Um, we are working on, on uh, with two startups on curing heart disease and stroke, and one uh, would, if successful, would cure basically all cancers. So my tip would go to heart disease, stroke, and cancer. Well, that uh, you know, you both just said it's like it's it's more, it's natural, but that's huge things actually. Uh, Vitaly, what have you to uh, to add? What do you think? Which disabilities or diseases might um, just vanish in 10, 15, 20 years? So from my point of view, this won't be something very revolutional because it's very short time frame. Um, so that's kind of uh, maybe novel gene therapies uh, that will help us to treat uh, not only age-related diseases like Alzheimer or diabetes, but also uh, like other defunction, dysfunctions like uh, autoimmune diseases. And uh, for example, a small upgrade gene therapy against diabetes uh, could be a routine procedure in 20 years, and we know that it's uh, it's on its path towards FDA, um, and uh, might be some something fa funny like um, hair loss 
could also be um, treated by gene therapies. And uh, we think that um, today it's a good time for a new type of individualized medicine. And uh, the current, uh, I think, challenge for uh, companies in pharma particularly is to master individualized medicine and uh, to master the, that at scale. Because um, today we see that uh, uh, gene therapies, radical gene therapies are extremely expensive and they don't try to scale. This is how current pharma works. So I, I bet on non-radical changes, but uh, I would say that treatments of Alzheimer's, diabetes and hair loss would be routine very soon. Well, we'll have a look further into the future uh, later, don't worry. Um, now we want to dive deeper into uh, what each of you is, is working on. And uh, Michael, maybe we start with you and the Forever Healthy Foundation. Uh, with the foundation and also with your investments into startups, you're active in the era of rejuvenation or longevity. Um, so it's all about aging and st really stopping or re even reversing aging. Um, do you really think that aging can be reversed and if so, and I guess you are, uh, why? <laughs> yes, uh, uh, it, it's not really that, uh, it's, it's not a matter of belief anymore. So if you're into that technology, if you're into the science, uh, we know what to do as David uh, Sinclair pointed out and others as well. So the theoretical groundwork, what to do uh, on uh, to reverse aging and to repair the body on a molecular and cellular level has been laid out. Um, the basic research has started years ago already. Of course, there could be much more. This is also why we are funding research in that area, but more research is needed. Uh, and addition to that, the, the first research results are already taken up by startups and these startups work on transferring this, transforming them into therapies for human use. And the first therapies that you could use are already available. So of course we cannot turn a 70 year old into a 30 year old yet but we can reverse some aspects of aging even today. What do you do to stay healthy? Maybe you could tell us um, because um, <laughs> Quite you tried things. some of those therapies. Oh yeah, I, I, I do a lot of those therapies. Uh, it starts with the basic thing that your grandma already told you. So eat well, eat a healthy diet, uh, don't get toxins in your body, sleep well. So it's the, the lifestyle thing, it's mental balance. It's, uh, I do very, very extensive health checkup, complete monitoring of my biochemistry um, uh, in all ways possible, imaging. Uh, I apply functional medicine, integrative medicine to uh, resolve imbalances. And then I'm also using the first generation of uh, rejuvenation therapies that are already available today. Could you name them for us? <laughs> Oh yeah, I well, there's oh, <laughs> it's quite a long list already. Uh, I, I raised you my take, NAD take plus the levels. Two most, most, most important. Well, well, it's raising uh, NAD plus. I take physetine as a first uh, uh, first cellulitic therapy that's available. Um, I do EDTA to decalcify in my capillary system. Um, I do light therapy for skin, uh, skin rejuvenation and uh, several others. Now let's talk about the work of your Forever Healthy Foundation because I, I guess you're not doing all this stuff because you somehow think it's a good thing, but you rely also on the work of the foundation. <laughs> and as I got it from our previous conversation, uh, the work is about collecting, evaluating and process the knowledge that's already out there about the therapies in development and on the market. Maybe you could tell us a bit more about the, the work of the Forever Healthy Foundation? Yeah, that's one initiative. What, what, you, what you mentioned is one initiative of our foundation. It's called Rejuvenation Now. Um, as I said, the first generation of rejuvenation therapies are already available now. But, uh, and that's a big but, the market for those therapies are, is really cowboy style. So there, it's completely marketing driven. There's no transparency. There's no trusted source of information. Um, uh, people try to sell really expensive stuff that that's not working. There's no focus on risks and risk management. So if you're uh, an early adopter and want to use these therapies, you're virtually at a complete loss and you have to do all the research on your own, which is a lot of, lot of work, even for a single therapy. 
So uh, what we do is we have a long list of all the potential therapies and we do, uh, and then we pick one therapy and we do an in-depth analysis. Uh, we look at all the research that's out there. It's usually between two and 3,000 research papers. Um, we select the most relevant clinical and preclinical trials, usually between 100 and 200. Um, we do an in-depth analysis and then we do a very, very comprehensive write-up. What are the benefits? What are the risks? How would the potential therapy look like? What is the potential risk management that you can use? And um, then we publish that open access on our website. Uh, we have done this so far for five uh, uh, therapies. And we are um, continuing to do this. So uh, we have a long list. I think there are more than 30 things on, on, still on there. Uh, so quite some work to do. But the idea is to provide both medical doctors and uh, uh, early adopters with high level information to make educated decisions of whether they want or do not want to do a certain therapy. So to, to sum this up, you separate the expensive bullshit that is marketed out there from the stuff that uh, has scientific proof. Uh, great. Um, Carola, um, you know, reversing the aging process, that sounds a lot like science fiction, but the technology that you're working on at InBrain could also ma make things possible that seemed unthinkable. Um, could you name some of those um, things that might be possible using brain computer interfaces for us? Sure. And by the way, I have to declare that my great grandfather was 113 years old. So I hope to carry some of those genes and then you Whoa. pass me the list of drugs that you're using and I'll review that. But <laughs> going back to in brain, well, in brain, uh, it is changing neurotech because it's changing the materials by which the neural interfaces are made of, right? So uh, it's, it's been uh, several decades that neural interfaces already exist at some level of degree, some level of, of um, therapeutical effect, uh, but all these interfaces are made of metals. So by changing metals by graphene, we can actually get a level of resolution that we never got before and therefore understand the brain in a, in a way that we never were able to do before, right? And this is going to open for sure a way to not only read what the brain is telling us, but also write in the brain what we need to write in order to correct some of the symptoms of some of the diseases like Parkinson and epilepsy and others that we hope to find biomarkers for. Oh, maybe we could go a step back and you explain us how exactly a brain computer interface or a neural interface works. Um, what do you put in the, the brain and how do you do it now and how, how could you do it in, in the future? Yeah. So, as I said, there are, there are already neural interfaces that exist from several industrial players and they are leads that you put on the brain in certain nuclei of the brain and every nuclei actually correspond to a different disease. So we have this subthalamic nucleus that it is actually correcting some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but there is other like globus pallidus. And if you will put the lead and deliver some bioelectricity there, you will actually correct dystonia, which is a highly debilitating disease. You know, babies even completely cram and rigid and not being able to move. Um, if you put it in many other targets like the ventral capsule ventral striatum, you can correct the symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder and so on. So every time and with the help of very renowned experts, not only within brain, but you know, in the community, we research new targets to correct new symptoms. So basically it's placing the leads in the right place and use bioelectricity, so the same way that the neurons communicate between them to actually correct some of the imbalances that we see in these uh, circuits, right? So this is usually done with a battery that is usually implanted. In our case, we are going to remove or transform these, these systems as well. And then, of course, it's, it's about looking at what are the patient symptoms that are relieved by programming those leads 
with different uh, parameters in order to deliver to every patient what they need. This is what is being done today already. Yeah? And um, so to, you, we already have brain computer interfaces. That, that's what, uh, what you just told us. And you can put uh, those into certain areas of the brain to read them. Um, but what's the problem with them? Why are they not in, in widespread use? And what could be better with the material that, uh, that you are counting on, the graphene? Yes. So currently, uh, they have very good therapeutic effect on those patients that, that work. So first of all, they are quite invasive. So despite the need, I mean, one out of three patients um, might have a brain disorder and they might benefit of some kind of, some kind of neuro, uh, neuro tech technology because they are drug refractory, right? So they are not responding to medical treatment and they don't have any other choice. However, some of these people that will have the chance to have some of these neural interfaces reject the therapy because they are quite invasive at the moment. They are made of metals. The metals are hard to miniaturize and they also have very low resolution when reading some of these brain signals, so you cannot you cannot predict in which patients is going to really work and in which patients it's not going to work, right? So we are trying to change that. So we come out to the market with much more or much less invasive neural interfaces, but also with a much higher spatial and temporal resolution in a way that is like having a microscope for these brain signals. And we can really, and in a personalized way, look at these brain signals, understand them, uh, find the biomarkers that correspond to every of these disease, and trigger a response that actually stop the, the symptoms of this disease. And um, graphene allow that miniaturization, but also that high um, signal to noise ratio that actually give us the resolution we need to create the response. Uh, based on the personal biomarkers for each patient. Great. Uh, thanks, Carola. Let's go back to the aging and Vitaly. Uh, Vitaly, you are the founder of uh, Centaura, and that's an organization that's also working on reversing the aging process. But your goal is particularly ambitious, I think. You even want to make humans immortal, if I got it right. Um, is that a distant vision or do you think there's a chance for us uh, that we, you know, become immortal? Yeah, so I don't want uh, watchers to be uh, so shocked about this. Uh, actually, we're the most uh, conservative probably company organization in the market. So uh, I, I'm not optimistic as David Sinclair or others. I think that uh, many scientists today are extremely underestimating the complexity of this topic because um, the problem is that they compare, they look at uh, what happens in other fields. And I, I am, I'm coming from Deep Tech, my uh, first company, Wayray is a Deep Tech vertical integrated company. And uh, we have tried to crack uh, a small part of physics uh, for eight years and many, com many other companies didn't weren't able to crack this this topic of holography for more than 30 years. And now, um, and I see that the complexity of, uh, of finding uh, correlations of markers, biomarkers for, for setting up the sequence of targets is a task that is billions of times more uh, complicated than anything humanity faced. And now I hear nice people, nice talking heads on many conferences uh, lots of people, uh, professors from different well-known universities that claim that they know what to do. I can guarantee you that nobody knows what actually to do, what to do and that uh, the biohacking is nice and is brave, but it uh, goes against the scientific approach. Uh, and there is currently no, uh, no therapy today that has proven for humans as a guarantee for uh, human lifespan and health span extension accept healthy lifestyle and diet uh, limit and, and uh, calorie uh, restriction. So I can say that, yes, our, our Centaur's approach is more heavy lifting. We want to do the heavy lifting nobody wants to do because there is no money in pharma and there is no money in venture capital for doing real stuff. Uh, many companies, uh, they will try to find one or several pathways and uh, create the one or three or five drugs 
but I can tell you it's not one or five drugs. It's, it's a non-stop therapy, non-stop individualized therapy. And before we understand what actually is going on in our body, uh, we cannot do, we were just kind of looking for a needle in the universe. It's impossible to find before we do collect the enormous amount of data and, and analyze this data. So I'm, this is the first part what we do. We actually invest in the, uh, we have an aging profile, the multi-omics approach where we try to extract data and see on different levels, uh, proto-omics, metabolomics, et cetera, uh, uh, the, the correlations of everything, of all the markers. And we try to, to find uh, tricks from data science uh, to kind of cut out all the, all the uh, unnecessary, um, uh, unnecessary information and find the real ones. But that's extremely, um, extremely hard task before we do the therapies, actually ther actual therapies. So in my opinion, uh, making humans immortal is possible from the biological point of view. Uh, but uh, many, I mean, 99% of the industry underestimates that. And I can tell you that 95% of people who are being invited to many conferences and who are really who are really cool professors in the industry, they are uh, mostly scam because they are going uh, towards <laughs> money, towards um, classical, yes, it's, it's true, the culture is classical venture capital uh, style. And they, uh, I know personally many professors who serve in scientific advisory boards on many aging companies, and they, 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 just, uh, they just go towards the fundraising and these people, they dilute real science. And I know that there are many no, projects um, that have been abandoned uh, for something. Before, uh, before uh, <laughs> I, think we got the, I think we got the point. Um, I wonder what David Sinclair <laughs> okay. would say about this. He did some studies, actually. Um, but now, uh, if everything that, you know, all the other... I'm not talking about working, David Sinclair, by the way. It's not about David Sinclair. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Um, well, anyway, um, now you have to tell us what, what, what uh, is the solution that you're aiming for? You're saying you're doing yes. the groundwork now, but what's, uh, when I got it right, uh, you're working on a, what you call, or what I call, would call a re revolutionary gene therapy. Maybe you can describe what this yeah. the solution could be, um, because if you got the answer that 99% mm -hmm. of the others don't have, we want at least get a glimpse of it. <laughs> I'm not saying that it's only us who can find an answer. So the gene therapy that we're using is a hack human artificial chromosome. It's alternative to classical uh, viral vectors like CRISPR. It can handle a thousand times more uh, genetic information than, than classical uh, viral vectors. Uh, so basically, to explain it in a very simple way, imagine we have developed the sequence of targets for a particular human and we can integrate this human artificial chromosome that acts as a computer that measures all the changes in the body and at the same time reacts. So it's kind of real-time computer which is upgradable and uh, with this human artificial chromosome we don't uh, we don't interfere with the with the DNA of, of the of the body of, 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 of human uh, we don't integrate in the host and we can regulate it after introduction to the cell. So that's uh, that's type of therapy has been predicted dozens of years ago, but we were the first ones to successfully master it, to synthesize it. And now it could be used for, for different gene therapies. And eventually when we know what to do with aging, then it can be used as a, as a tool for tackling all these problems. In my opinion, this is the most radical at the same time, safe way to fight aging in the future in 20, 30, 50 years from now. Michel, I wonder what, we, what you were uh, thinking about uh, what Vitaly was just saying, because you're already investing into um, specific star startups and they are working on you know, specific age-related problems. So do you think, what do you think about this um, completely different approach compared to the approaches that you are uh, looking into? Yeah, well, we are not working that on, we are not working on immortality. Uh, personally, I think immortality is a, uh, uh, a weird concept, not even the universe is Im immortal. So um, it's a bit um, hard to understand what immortality for humans would look like. Um, and I have to disagree, there are already therapies that you can use to reverse some aspects of the aging process. Um, of course, you cannot, as I said, turn a 70 year old into a 30 year old, but you can reverse aspects of aging, like for example, calcification of the capillary system, uh, and other things that uh, 
for example, would reduce your um, uh, probability to have a heart attack or a stroke. I'm sorry, but this is uh, it's age-related disease. It's not aging in cell. It's well, uh, these are diseases. Well, really, if you're working in the field, you should know that's just one of the same thing. Mm, no, I disagree with okay. this. I don't think. Well, no, this is totally okay. We are not <laughs> a conference where everybody opinion, has to agree. Um, so uh, that's what we want. We want discussions and we want uh, disagreement as long as we do it uh, with a smile on our face. And I guess we make that. Um, but you mentioned already um, you're working on a different gene therapy. But um, I know that all of you are not working, um, you know, specifically on on CRISPR, uh, the gene. Um, uh, the technology that enables us to modify the human genome in a very targeted manner. Maybe we could have a look at this um, shortly because it, it won the Nobel pr Prize uh, this year. Um, CRISPR um, you know, could make it possible to cure uh, previously incurable diseases, but it could also lead to somehow optimize people. Um, maybe um, you could, uh, each of you three could t tell me how, what, what do you think, you know, from the outside about this technology? Do you think it's, it's a threat? Do you think it's a chance? And maybe how it could affect your work, um, be it uh, brain uh, diseases or be it uh, aging and age-related diseases. Um, Michael, maybe you want to start. If you, um, do you already have an uh, opinion about CRISPR? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, it, it, it's for the foreseeable future. It's not going to help us any, to do anything to either slow down or reverse aging, um, because um, uh, the things that people are working right on is um, reprogramming. Um, uh, CRISPR is not at, at, uh, at the level that you could affect all the cells in the body, so um, there's no efficient way that you can reach every cell in the body, which you would in the end have to do um, to do a gene therapy. And then also turning, uh, optimizing our metabolism by uh, uh, changing genes is like trying to optimize a combustion engine car. You would still get all the, um, uh, the damage that the car does to itself just due to be in operation. So it wouldn't turn into an electric car just by using a gene therapy. So you would still have to do um, repair like, um, I don't know, you have senescent cells, you have to kill them. Um, you got uh, debris outside the cells. Um, you got numerous different aging processes that could be probably better tackled with like epigenetic reprogramming. Uh, Carola, what about um, your field? Um, do you think that some of the diseases that you're working yes. on could also be cured with CRISPR, or do you, can you combine a BCI with a, with CRISPR? What do you think? <laughs> Well, first of all, um, I'm very proud and I hope you allow me this little celebration that the Nobel Prize for CRISPR went to two magnificent women. And um, I always celebrate women getting the Nobel Prize. I think we need more of those. And then to your question, um, I haven't reflected enough about this, but there is already enough problems on brain-related diseases to combine many of these big ideas, right? I think that uh, actually, in reality, many of these diseases are also very unknown on their etiology. And we say they are multifactorial diseases, right? Some of them are not even, or not, don't have a, co a genetic component. They are a product of the environment. I mean, there is a pretty well-known uh, Parkinson pesticide model that is replicable in primates. So... In, in, in our case, in brain-related diseases, for those that have a genetic component, you know, maybe, and if there is application um, for solving some of these, um, yeah, mutations that create these symptoms and these uh, diseases, it would be fantastic, of course. But I will have to think about it more through, and uh, again, always in my case always with a therapeutic application because you look at the problem of brain related disorders it is huge right so solving that first before thinking of the other big ideas of longevity and the rest for me is a priority but i understand people want to live forever healthy and vitaly you already i guess i heard through that you're not so impressed with crispr What's what, what's your thought about no, CRISPR? I didn't I didn't say this. I, I think actually I agree with Michael. This is not the the 
the only therapy that could be used for for aging and it's not safe and it's not going to solve everything so crispr is is a tool and it's been used in many ways it's it's a tool which is great and we also are using this tool to uh, to assemble the sequence of, of human artificial chromosome so it's uh, it's nice tool i wouldn't uh, use it uh, just for fun uh for 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 not extreme diseases because it's it not it's not always working as is intended but i think it's a great uh, great finding it's a great uh, technology that has been developed uh, I, i'm just saying that it's not uh, it's not the one that will be used for for fighting aging aging uh, by itself now before we see if we got questions from the audience i wanted to ask you all of you um how you deal with hope uh because the things that the therapies, the med tech that you're working on might raise a lot of hope, uh, especially for people who are um, who have uh, conditions. Um, and you're also hoping, of, of course, for great results. You know, how much hope or hype is too much and how much is too little? You know, because I think you have to somehow raise the awareness for what you're doing. Um, how, you know, how, how do you deal with that? Uh, Michael, how do you make sure that you don't oversell and don't Undersell. I don't know if that word exists, but you know what I mean, I guess. Yeah. The, well, for us, it's uh, <laughs> the good thing is we are non-profit, uh, uh, and and we don't have we we're not selling anything, so we're just delivering results and let people decide on their own. So we're publishing our our papers, open access. Um, so if people are using it, fine. If people are not using it, we're also fine with that. Um, and the startups, the result will speak for themselves. So. Um, uh, I think it's not not much use to just uh, uh, create hype. You have to show data, and uh, this is a particular tool for the startups and and for the financing that you want to have in startups. You just have to show data and results that you are on the way to deliver therapy, and in the end, the proof is in the pudding. So, and I'm really, we're really, I'm I'm really hoping that, and if not one of ours, but one of uh, one other startup is actually demonstrating a reversal of aspects of aging in humans um, and uh, that's going to be the proof so nothing else will count in the end other things other just talking about it won't help my opinion carola what about you um how do you deal with raising yeah. hopes yeah i think hope keep us going uh, which is good but it's our responsibility to set the, the framework of that hope in terms of length to wait for that hope, right? Otherwise, we, we run the risk. And I've been with patients all my life. You know, I like to be on the, on the bedside and on the home side because they are now more and more, uh, you know, being treated by, by telemonitoring at home. Um, but being with patients and and letting them know what is coming and when it's coming is very important because what I was going to say is that many patients wait. They wait for that hope and they don't get the treatment they need today. And that is wrong, right? So we have to bear the responsibility of that and be very clear about what is coming and what is not coming. And of course, everything needs to be extremely ethical and back up with data, right? So same as uh, with Michael. Vitaly, you want to add something or do you just agree with the others? I do agree with others. I uh, just want to add that uh, we need to be careful, particularly in aging, that uh, this industry is not becoming blockchain as it was two, three years ago. Lots of hype and then poof, disappeared and uh, lots of Elon Musks who haven't became them. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I just, I just uh, want, as I said in the beginning, I, I'm just worried that People are getting too excited about what's possible um, in the near term or even mid term. Great. Um, let, let me have a look at our control centrums for Antwortliche Muriel. Muriel, oh, you're on camera now, so please take your feet off, off the table. Well, okay, it's fine. <laughs> Do you have yeah, do you have questions? Comfortable here to have everything <laughs> do you have, do under, have under control. Do so, you have questions from the audience? Yeah, we do have. So here, for example, what are the biggest challenges to be solved in the area of longevity? Is one of them the lifespan of neurons, probably? Um, 
Michael Vitali, maybe you can answer this one. What's the, the ma major challenge in, in longevity? The life cycle I, I, of neurons? Well, I can take that. I think um, th there is no major challenge. Um, th they are all challenges. So in, in order to extend the maximum lifespan, uh, if you look at aging, aging is not a single process. It's uh, a, 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 a multitude of uh, processes that are going on. A multitude of things are going wrong. Awesome. And we have to fix them all. So, so if we would just, for example, yeah. just cure cancer, yeah. all cancers, our life expectancy would go up for four years something. So uh, you would die of something else then. So um, uh, there's uh, not a single thing that you can do. So uh, you ha we have to do lots of things in order to really um, uh, extend the healthy lifespan um, um, by decades or even longer. Yeah, can I add something? Um, I think I, that I actually about I neurons, it was a good question issues. because um, uh, we we think, I think the humanity thinks me? that that uh, uh, brain itself as a separate uh, as a separate Michael, entity is going to be something challenging to 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 treat and even if we get to a momentum where uh, all cells are being rejuvenated uh, they nobody knows how human psyche can behave in such long period of time like like hundreds of years what happens in our psyche that's also absolutely unexplored field <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> But I think it would be good to find out, to have the opportunity to find out. <laughs> yeah, at simulations, or I don't know, a virtual Sigmund Freud. Okay, now you're all looking, you're looking at us. Uh, Miri, you have another question? Yes, I do. Um, and this is basically for um, Vitaly. Um, which data sources, uh, sensors, etc., do you use for the data collection? Uh, is it referring to Centaur or to Wayred? <laughs> because uh, I think that the data collection was meant the markers that we are uh, we're we're collecting uh, with the lifelines, for example, is, uh, these are classical uh, um, uh, banks uh, with blood samples or other tissue samples. So we don't use uh, in Centaur. We don't use uh, today uh, any any sensors for uh, for collecting the data because I think the liquids have the most uh, the most valuable information in it. Yeah, but if it was about Centaur, because in Wary it's completely different. Thank you. Uh, what also, the next in live stream hörst du alles. Are you working? Are you? Uh, I think they are looking for the next question. Sorry, we have some technical issues here. As long as you can hear us, everything is fine. Do you have an another question, Muriel, or I go on? definitely have one more um, right. from an investor point of view what are the best information sources or courses to become competent enough to pick the most promising companies in the field I think this is more for Michael I think it's maybe for all three of them or this <laughs> Michael, oh, that, that's a start? tough Just one uh, the market is extremely early, so as with every market where you're super early, <laughs> the risk is extremely high. So you should really know what you're doing. You should know a lot about biochemistry. You should know about how to run a, a, a startup, how a company should operate in that field, what the risks are. If you're not uh, familiar with that, uh, that's not your market right now. So, um, uh, and you could, to, to learn about it, you could go to conferences, <laughs> uh, a bit, bit uh, complicated right now. Uh, the Life Extension uh, Advocacy Foundation, Leave, Lifespan.io, they have an investors network, they do regular Zoom calls, uh, where you could uh, uh, get a bit of uh, feeling for the market, uh, but it's not a market for the faint-hearted, not for somebody who doesn't know uh, about the technology. Does someone want to add something? Uh, Carola, maybe you can say something about um, your, your field or, uh, that you're working on. So I, I'm not an investor and actually learn everything I know about investments and fundraising in Wikipedia. So, um, and of course, you know, through the experience, 
But what I could tell you is that teams make a difference. You can have a revolutionary technology that if it's executed by a poor team, then um, it's not going to happen. And the opposite, right? So trying to get a sense of team performance, I think it's key. Or well, This is what I will do as an investor, actually, because um, people can conquer the world if they set their mind to do that, right? So it's about the dynamics of the team and the capabilities of the team and, and, and the um, abilities to find the answers to every hurdle. That's what I will recommend, to focus on the team. Of course, the environment and the technology are very important, but, but good teams find their way. All right. Um, I got a last question to all of you, and we have some time with that. Um, let's look into the year 2100. And now consider everything that you're working on and everything else that's happening out there in the field, and maybe just be optimistic. What do you think? Uh, how will we humans, our human bodies, be like? Will we all be connected to a powerful AI with a brain-computer interface? Will we never get sunburned again because of genetic optimization? And of course, are we going to live to 120 years maybe? So basically, are we maybe experiencing the next step of human evolution and, um, within this uh, next 80 years? What, what do you think? Um, Vitaly, maybe you, you want to start. I know you said it's going to be slow and it's not going to be in the next 10 or 20 years. That's why we jump to mm -hmm. 2100 now. What, what will be possible then? Yeah. So if we, are, if we don't die from climate change, uh, which I assume it's very, <laughs> very probable, uh, probable situation, uh, because the pandemic shows how we are, how humans are egoistic and uh, that uh, democracies are not uh, helping to, to deal with global challenges. Uh, I think that if, if we survive as a species, then, um, yeah, it's possible to go into the uh, so-called uh, uh, digital immortality. But uh, personally, I wouldn't uh, rush into my uh, own digital backup because before I uh, fully understand how humans' brain is functioning. So it's, um, it's a good time, 2100 uh, is a good time for having... Uh, uh, aging processes reverse, so I believe that uh, from biological point of view we can get to there, uh, but I'm not sure about the brain and psyche, so that's uh, that's a big question. And of course, to create a BCI that completely mimics uh, and able to 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 understand what's happening in the in, in the brain instantly and can connect to to uh, to a virtual cloud instantly and give you advanced computing uh, uh, possibilities. It's uh, less likely happening in 2100. Yeah. My point of view. You are, you're okay. the brain expert. What do you think? Will you, uh, your company that's huge then, I hope, uh, produce brain computer interfaces that connect us to the general AI? Yeah, but always for therapeutic purposes. So the, I believe in empowering patients and it's already a huge responsibility to receive your own data to understand it and to take care of yourself. I mean, you see it, you can go to the gym and probably you don't go, right? Or we don't go. So, I mean, it is really about responsibility. Even if we have the best of the tools, it's about how are we going to decide to use them and take advantage of them. So we, we are stubborn animals and um, we have to see how we yeah, get that responsibility and, and, and the energy to really take care of ourselves and, and keep going in the most healthy way. I think no matter what we will have in hundreds of years, what is going to keep us sane, it's really the love and the human care for each other, right? I mean, without that, we will also die. So I think that let's, let's keep innovating, let's keep being uh, feeding ourselves data to try to make better decisions but overall let's love each other and let's take care of each other because otherwise it would be a very sad humanity that's right so we have climate change on our list that we have to survive we have to keep on loving each other and caring for each other um michelle maybe you can say something about what you think will be possible in 2000, 2100 and also add some this kind of nice message to it if you want 
<laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, I think by 2100, we 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 hopefully have aging under full medical control. Um, but I think uh, dramatic things are going to ha happen before that. So um, rejuvenation or the extending or extension of human, uh, human high uh, life. Uh, lifespan and health span is not the only thing that's happened. We are, we are, it, is, it happens in the context. So we are uh, actually we're in exponential uh, technology development. We have artificial intelligence. We have um, uh, uh, gene modifications. We have robotics. We have molecular manufacturing will come uh, come along. Um, all that combined uh, will dramatically redefine what it means to be human. And I also think that we needed a uh, definite evolution of consciousness. Uh, 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 how, why are we here? What are we doing? Um, because if we don't have, to, if we don't have to work for a living anymore, and this is going to happen in the foreseeable future, um, then uh, we have to find different uh, reasons to be here. And this is the question that I probably, people have to answer for themselves. That is why am I here? What, what's my purpose? You know. Wow, okay, now you, you ended with kind of the biggest question out there, why are we here on Earth? But that's great because I think everybody asked uh, him or herself the question again. Um, thank you, uh, Carolina, Carolina, Michael and Vitaly for this discussion. Thank you for agreeing on most things, but don't, uh, but disagreeing on something. That's great because it's a field of technology. There's a lot of stuff happening out there. And thank you so much for joining us.